What's going on, everyone? I'm just a typical, average American here today to react and learn about the history of Scotland. And let me tell you, Americans don't know <laughs> the first thing about Scotland. And I mean, it's, I don't think it's anything against Scotland in particular. It's just that Americans don't really know much about a lot of places, sadly. Uh, you know, when I think of Scotland, and I think when a lot of Americans think of Scotland, the only things that actually truly come to mind are kilts and Shrek. <laughs> Shrek the ogre that doesn't exist in real life uh, because of his accent. Uh, other than that, gosh, I mean, through some... Uh, movies like Braveheart, Americans have some kind of exposure to Scottish culture, but we certainly don't know much about its history, if anything at all, and I, sadly, I don't think many Americans could point out Scotland on a map. I mean, up until a few weeks ago, I didn't know Scotland and others were part of the United Kingdom and all sorts of embarrassing things that I don't need to relive right now. But what I do need to live through right now is the history of Scotland, and I'm ready. I'm ready to learn it. I think, uh, let's take a look. In researching this video, I very quickly learned a valuable lesson about how little the Scots mess around. Okay! How little the Scots mess around. Are, are the Scot- you know, that's another thing Americans kind of think about Scottish people, that they're kind of badass. Maybe it's just because there's a lot- <laughs> we only think of movies where there's a lot of, like, fighting and historical conflict, or, but we do definitely think Scottish folk are pretty badass, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, I thought. The Scots and the English hate each other, sure, but it can't be. The Scots and England, my god, this just is throwing zinger after zinger at me. Uh, the Scots and English hate each other? Or don't like each other? Is hate too strong a word? I have learned a bit about English history, and some about the British Empire, you know, some things. And sure, there has been conflict that I know of. Nothing... I have trouble remembering specifics, but when we're talking about the modern day, is there a... is that a thing between Scotland and England? Is that a thing? Uh, I, I wanna know. Scots mess around. Okay, I thought. The Scots and the English hate each other, sure. Hate? Hate each other? Man. I mean, <laughs> I can't say if that's true one way or another. Or, but it can't be that bad, honestly. So I took a little peruse to see how many times the two actually fought each other and- Oh, no. oh, jeez. Sweet Mother Mary, that is a lot of stabbing! Sc Wait, all of those are Scottish-English conflicts? Actually fought each other and- Sweet Mother Mary, that is a <laughs> lot of stab- That's like dozens. That's like 50 or more. Stabbing! Scotland! you. Oh my <laughs> Scotland. I mean, I wouldn't be so quick to just point the finger at Scotland. I mean, who knows? Who? Maybe it's kind of, uh, England did some stuff, Scotland did some stuff. You know, I'm not gonna point the finger just yet. Trick question. England. <laughs> so be warned, the Scots throughout history okay. are every bit as bonkers as they come across on Twitter. To find oh, out why, geez. let's do some history. This video is brought to you by Audible. A thousand years ago, Scotland a wee bit ironic, seeing as the Scottish language is damn near inaudible. Around 2000... <laughs> and that is a whole thing. Uh, Americans really do enjoy the Scottish accent a lot. Um, and it is, I mean, Americans enjoy a good English accent, but Ameri to Americans, the Scottish accent is just a little more intense. <laughs> I don't I don't know what the best way to put it is. It's just a little more, uh, cool. Just like, I don't want to say aggressive, but it's a bit, uh, harsher. You know, it's just got more, like, not attitude, but it's got a lot of personality, Scottish accent. It's hard to describe. Uh, I've just grown up hearing it and just thought, like, that's so cool. Like, it's got such character to it. ...years ago, Scotland was inhabited by various tribes... Okay, how long ago? Language is damn near inaudible. 
Around 2,000 years ago, Scotland was inhabited by various tribes of Pictish Celts, living up north, herding, and minding their own business. So when the Roman Empire okay. swaggered up to try and conquer them, they gave those Romans a walloping so bad that Emperor... Celts. So, the, like, earliest history of Scotland, we're gonna say, is, like, Celtic? Not that I have any idea, you know, the first thing about Celts, but it's a kind of a good... I know the word, I'm somewhat familiar with it, so that's kind of the starting point, 2,000 years ago. Hadrian built a wall just to make sure that nobody ever tried to conquer them again. What? So bad that Emperor Hadrian... Roman Empire swag... The Roman Empire came, was trying to attack, I got that. ...geared up to try and conquer them, they gave those Romans a walloping so bad that Emperor Hadrian built a wall just to make sure that nobody ever tried to conquer them again. Essentially... Oh, wow. I just don't think you can do this one. I've been an assassin for a while now. What makes you think that- Oh, get that shit out of here, you're right! <laughs> so even though these original Celts weren't anything like modern Scots, it is refreshing to see the national character demonstrated so well at such an early stage. What? The national character? The characteristic that <laughs> Scotland just, like, beats down anyone who dares to try to attack them? Is that the character? Not the worst characteristic to have, by the way. Rome eventually collapsed, but Europe reintroduced itself to Scotland via Christianity and Anglo-Saxon migrations, which coalesced okay. through the 7th century into a few main groups. For our purposes, the most relevant two are the Picts and the Scoti. We're oh, wow. So, we're finally starting to get, like, the first remnants of possible early Scotland, Scottish culture here, with the Scotty, and these other things, Picts, Altklut, Northumbria, I've never heard of, ever. Where we get the name Scotia, aka Scotland. In 843, Kenneth MacAlpin united the okay. Scots and Picts in order to create the Kingdom of Alba. The early king- Kingdom of Alba, man! That's another thing about European countries. They just have, like, the coolest names, <laughs> like, America's history is somewhat short and, like, very straightforward, so there's no, like, forming in, of kingdoms, you know? Maybe, I don't know if that makes sense to people in the UK, <laughs> but to an American, it's like we've never experienced being part of a, a kingdom of this or that or forming, it's just like, so we have a highly romanticized view of it. Maybe sort of like an ignorant view of it, but where we're just like, man, that'd be cool to be a kingdom. <laughs> kingdom had to deal with the Vikings and the English in the 8 and 900s as land from every corner was getting yoinked. But beyond out- Oh wait, we got Vikings trying to yoink uh, Scottish territory at this point? Vikings and the English in the 8 and Picts in order to create the Kingdom of Alba. The okay. early kingdom had to deal with- So we have some of the different, what would be Scottish territories kind of- unifying and forming the Kingdom of Alba. The Kenneth MacAlpin united the Scots and Picts in order to create the Kingdom of Alba. Okay. The early kingdom had to deal with the Vikings and the English in the 8 and 900s as land from every corner was getting yoinked. Oh, okay. So already more con- Why does everyone want Scotland so bad? <laughs> I mean, it's obviously a cool place. Uh, but it's like you got, you got Vikings attacking you. England attacking you from the other side, trying to take your little islands, that, I can see why <laughs> uh, Scotland has uh, trust issues on this. It's like, everyone's trying to take your stuff, man. But beyond outside threats, there were also constant internal fisticuffs over the crown. Uh, the quintessential example- Okay, so at this point, we're talking about a crown, which would be like a monarchy. And you're already having, well, you're having external conflicts like anywhere on Earth's history any nation is having internal civil conflict as well. Example of the early Scottish king is Macbeth, whom hereafter mm. shall be referred to exclusively as McBoy because that play is haunted and I'm not looking for trouble. Trouble oh. is nearly- <laughs> I was gonna say, does this have any relationship to the famous play, Macbeth? Everything you might know about him from Shakespeare is wrong. Here's why. See, the Scottish crown didn't follow a strict succession, but claimants came to debate who was best fit to rule, and this caused constant ah. disputes that escalated into wars. Okay. That's interesting how it doesn't just follow a very strict bloodline succession, and you actually are, like, listening to people who have claim to the throne and stuff. That would certainly cause a lot of conflict doing it that way. Everyone would want to, you know... Put their, the, the local farm boy, the blacksmith, would be like, Hey, I think I got a claim to the throne. What the heck? Why not? I'll put it out there. 
So McBoy actually killed King Duncan in a battle in the year 1040 and ruled for the next 17 years peacefully, generously, and successfully. Wait, he actually, it, to some extent, took the throne by killing, like, uh, a king or killing a member of royalty and then they got the throne? That's I only thought that happened in <laughs> TV shows or something. That's actually kind of badass. In 1057, he died in another battle against Duncan's son Malcolm Canmore, who then assumed the throne. All that okay. stuff about murder conspiracies got added by Scottish historians centuries later, but civil wars over the throne were already a matter of protocol since the kingdom had gotten started. Like, boy's wow. real-life path was actually quite standard. But speaking of wonky royal succession crises, the next decade brought the Norman conquest of England, and William the Conqueror's second son Henry married King Malcolm's daughter. The okay. family relations are confusing now, and they stay that way for the next thousand years, so I'm right. going to try to avoid specifics where I can for the sake of my sanity, but the bottom line- <laughs> Okay, thank you. And for the sake of me, I'm a, sim I'm a simple man. Is that the King of Scotland exchanged notes with his sister, the Queen of England, about culture and statecraft. Wait, the King of Scotland's sister was the Queen of England? Does this, uh, man. I wonder how that even happens, for one thing. We just kind of glossed over it. The, but that royalty, I guess that's just kind of how royalty works a lot of the time. Is that you're going to marry into families and have relationships like that across nations for the sake of peace and building power and whatnot. So in the following two centuries, Scotland picked up some Norman tricks, like a central bureaucracy, a church hierarchy, and a curious new language derived from the Norman French. Oh. Just like, <laughs> no big deal, just picking up entire languages and new forms of centralized government, no big deal. <laughs> Called Scots. The native Gaelic was still the dominant language in the Highlands especially, but the Lowlands trended slowly towards the customs of their anglicized southern neighbors. Okay. The 11 and 1200 saw a steady back and forth between Scotland and England along the borders in Northumbria, but not a whole lot of drama. Un oh. Until. Yeah, I mean, it does make sense, doesn't it? that there I mean it didn't ha history didn't have to be this way I don't know how it all worked but this is apparently how it went down when you have this border between England the north of England and southern Scotland it kept changing just slightly based on gosh what probably turned out to be a really tedious war of attrition over that territory at the border just changing ever so slightly as time went on However, the King of Scotland died in 1286 without a clear heir, and rather than have all 13 possible cousins duke it out the old-fashioned way, they called <laughs> in the English King to mediate the dispute, which, I don't know, seems like kind of a short-sighted and terrible idea. Wait, the King of Scotland died? Didn't name a clear successor? So they brought in the King of England to help mediate it? But then, didn't Scotland and England not really get along at this point? Am I understanding correctly? The dispute with 13 possible as Scotland died in 1286, but not a whole lot of drama. Until, however, the King of Scotland died in 1286 without a clear heir, and yeah. rather than have all 13 possible cousins duke it out the old-fashioned way- uh, You know what? Maybe they shoulda. <laughs> Maybe them times, that's the best way to do it. Have all 13 cousins in, uh... <laughs> Mortal Kombat, Battle Royale, drop them in a circle, and the king comes out. <laughs> they called in the English king to mediate the dispute, which, I don't know, seems like kind of a short-sighted and terrible idea. Why did they do that? I thought there must be something going on with the relationship here. I, I did just say that the royalty between Scotland and England was more complicated than I certainly understand. <laughs> So there must have been a good reason to do this, it, this way. Unsurprisingly, King Edward installed the weakest, most pliable puppet who would let him treat Scotland like a vassal state. And yeah, yeah, that makes complete sense. Maybe they had a lot more trust in King Edward than they should have. Maybe that was kind of the error there. Edward just immediately puts like a pawn in place, right? Where it's just like... Yeah, uh, Frank over there is the, <laughs> the king of Scotland. Frank the blacksmith is king of Scotland, and I control Frank. So, but, I, but I'm not going to tell you that. And when even that pushover got fed up with forfeiting Scottish land, paying tribute, and kneeling to English superiority, King Edward invaded Scotland, dethroned the king, and yoinked the Scottish coronation stone back to Westminster. Dragon Wait, this I was not completely aware of. 
there was a time when basically England had taken over all of Scotland, and it was just one big, I mean, for lack of a better word, uh, one big England, sorta. I'm sure it was a bit more complicated. That's like the stupid version. That's like the me. That's like the simple me version. But uh, is that kind of what happened? Scotland firmly under the English heel. This was frankly terrible, so the Scots duly rebelled against England under the command oh, okay. of the famous William Wallace. Okay. Who won a vic William Wallace! That's that's literally the plot of Bra Braveheart. I was like, never knew that. Never knew that. Okay. Now, <laughs> how sad is this? How sad? It's like the one part I can finally understand and relate to is because it's a it was a movie released in America. <laughs> I was like, I get it. I understand now. It's something I can relate to. But uh, this this does seem kind of inevitable that England is like taking over all of Scotland, um, and Scotland's not on board for it. And they're like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna rebel. Uh, and William Wallace, I've heard of him. Victory the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297, but lost horrendously at Falkirk the next year, and was okay. later executed by England and paraded around Scotland in pieces. Quick fun fact. Wow, jeez. Hey, there he is. <laughs> of the many, many reasons that the movie Braveheart sucks, the blue war paint that everybody's wearing is about a thousand years out of style for the Scots. I mean, come oh, on. Oh man, we couldn't even get the... The historical accuracy, right? Do Scottish people enjoy this movie, Braveheart? It, I, I, I'm already hearing that it's not totally accurate, so I wonder. And that kind of anachronism is like because this ha this movie probably has one of the biggest influences ever on American perception of Scotland. So yeah. As, as uh, <laughs> good or bad as that is. Dressing the cast of The Godfather in togas. It was after Wallace died that Robert the Bruce took up the mantle of Guardian of Scotland. Okay. He had to kill a rival claimant to earn his title, but he also earned an excommunication from the Pope because apparently murdering somebody in a church is impolite. <laughs> uh, yeah. And a mortal sin. Whatever. He was defeated early by Edward in 1306 and went into hiding for a year before returning to win the Battle of Loudon Hill. From there, he stomped out okay. local rivalries and united Scotland fully against the English at the decisive Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. Though the treaty- Wow, I mean, gosh, there's a lot of history left to go. There's like a thousand more years to go. And the, the deep history of conflict between England and Scotland, I'm getting it. I'm picking up what they're putting down. This, this runs deep. There was a lot of... I didn't know there was so many moments when England, ex like, extended so far into Scotland and then was pushed back out, and I had no idea. These weren't signed for another 15 years. Robert the Bruce won Scotland three centuries of independence in that battle. Quick OS pro tip, okay. skip Braveheart, but watch The Outlaw King. It's better and way more accurate. Wait, that's actually a good tip. <laughs> I've never seen that. So having fulfilled his dreams for his kingdom, Robert died the next year, but this was exceptionally poor timing and really unfortunate in the long run because the throne passed to a series of useless kings from the House of Stuart for the next several decades. Okay. Through the 13 and 1400s, Scotland had no real leadership, so the local lords started throwing hands, or more accurately, glamours. And this, this has happened a couple times in Scotland, huh? Where they seem to have uh, trouble designating like a a very simple or a very obvious line of succession or, or at least there's something that always seems to happen and then everyone in scotland who kind of figures they have a claim to the throne is like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna go after this thing it's a <laughs> it's a free-for-all in this case the warring states were actually the dozens of clans scattered across the lowlands and highlands mercifully right. england had just gotten sucked into the hundred years war with france so scotland was free to be its own antagonist the way god intended and oh wait what is that <laughs> i mean so finally england is like really distracted by like being invaded by france so scotland's finally like ha ah! Our turn, buddy boy. And although the Stuart clan still held the crown, other families like the Douglas clan were regularly challenging them for land and power. Some progress okay. came with King James I in 1406, who sent 12,000 Scotsmen to fight with France against England in the Hundred Years' War, winning oh. game while returning home in a strong position to consolidate many of the clans under his crown and reform the kingdom. Unfortunately, he got assassinated and- Wait, wait, wait. So, Scotland just straight up ended up 
uh, working with France to fight England. Why didn't they attack from, like, the north of England down? It, this almost makes it look like they sailed around the side of England and attacked the southern side with France. May, I'm sure there was good reasoning for all of this. You know, I'm, I'm just sitting here watching uh, animation of it, so what do I know? But uh, I am curious about that. To consolidate many against England in the Hundred Years, James I in 1406, who sent 12,000 Scotsmen to fight with France against England in the Hundred Years' War, winning uh -huh. big and returning home in a strong position to consolidate- Oh, they did win big. Okay. I was like, what What happened there, though? ...many of the clans under his crown and reformed the kingdom. Unfortunately, he got okay. assassinated, and it was right back to the seesawing balance of power between kings, regents, lords, and clans. <laughs> of course. Of course. Man, S Scotland gets, like, one of its first big victories. It's like, yeah, we're doing it, man. We're doing it. And then immediately, James I gets assassinated, and we're right back to everyone fighting over who's king. Even after James, the... I mean... I, no matter what I say, you, one thing I gotta admit is this history of Scotland is infinitely more interesting than, like, the history of America. Like, there is so much more going on. It's just, like, not even really close. Highlanders still largely spoke Gaelic and paid little heed to the culture or politics of the anglicized royal court in the lowlands. The king could say whatever he wants down in Edinburgh, but unless he personally marches up to Inverness to tell Clan Fraser in person to pay their taxes, it's not gonna happen. And one <laughs> king even tried that, but still nothing happened. It's mm. just all very Game of thrones -y for a couple centuries. And yeah. I mean, heck, it's at this time that the War of the Roses is raging on just down the street. And you know what? Since it's just a big mess anyway, I'm gonna speed round through the next 300 years, so bear Okay. <laughs> okay, we're just gonna speed through 300 years. With me, and let's get ready for a game of Monarchy is Volatile! Let's meet our yeah. players! One king was really cool and helped reform the government to work for more of Scotland while making Edinburgh into a renaissance capital of learning and culture. One queen okay. got the short end of the stick when Scotland's parliament voted to convert to Protestantism while she was on vacation in France, and then she got the shorter end of the stick when England imprisoned her for two decades and then executed her. Oh my god, you know, for some reason... In America, Mary Queen of Scots is like a very famous name. Like every American has heard of Mary Queen of Scots. I don't know if it's just because she has a cool title, Queen of Scots, <laughs> or what? Because even though I know her name, I had no idea about her history. So I wonder why that is, why that name is so well known in America. Her son played his cards just right and inherited the throne of England from his cousin, the childless Elizabeth, and then became king of England and Scotland. His son was so wow. inconceivably bad at being king that his abuse- This is what I'm talking about again, where once again, we're having another period in time where England and Scotland kind of were united into one nation. I'm sure that uh, <laughs> this didn't last long. Uses of power brought England and Scotland into open rebellion for entirely separate reasons. And his yeah. reign ended with the British Isles locked in 12 years of civil war before everybody called a do-over and gave the crown back to his son. One oh king my became God. king because Parliament literally invited him from the Netherlands to replace their current monarch. And then he proceeded to strangle Scottish trading rights. And the last queen on our list tried to be a pal by offering Scotland a national union with England to open up trade avenues in exchange for the bargain price of near all of their sovereignty. I'd originally- My goodness. This stuff, like, it's crazy how we ended up where we ended up, right? All of this is just, like, madness. <laughs> it's just so many different ways things could have gone with all these individuals uh, being brought in and pushed out and killed and captured and, hey, I'll give you a deal to unite with us and then we either accept it or not. It's just- it's crazy we ended up where we did. <laughs> to open up trade avenues in exchange for the bargain price of nearly all of their sovereignty. I had originally gone way in depth about how all of this stuff went down in my first draft, but then I realized, you know what? Royal politics is dumb and confusing and I- It's not, it's not dumb. It is extremely confusing. Uh, and it would, oh my gosh, it would take so much time to go through all six of those monarchs individually. So I understand why you kind of condense it for this video's purpose. I kind of hate it more than anything else in history. So I'm gonna skip through it. <laughs> yeah. So I did. 
One standout okay. event from the mid-1500s is when the King of England tried to drive a wedge between a long-standing alliance between Scotland and France in the hopes to endear Scotland to their southern English neighbors. Right, right. Scotland does have that. They were working with France to fight England. Is that something that still, like, affects the modern day? Because um, America certainly had its share of wars with all sorts of different countries in the past. And it seems like pretty much in the modern day, America is willing to do trade and economic prosperity with all sorts of countries, even ones we've gone to war against in the past. So is there still any, I don't know how you'd put it, hard feelings between England or Scotland or France or any of that? Because that's something that's just in, would be in the modern day culture. Like, I would have no clue how, I, I'm just tr wondering based on this history. They did this by pillaging the lowlands and burning Edinburgh to the ground. You may find that this is a bad way to make new friends. The Scots <laughs> came to call the seven year campaign the rough wooing, as they did not appreciate being bullied into love. And this sentiment yeah. persisted for centuries, way up until the Act of Union in 1707. Scotland okay. was suspicious of the Queen's offer of partnership, and while they'd get one metric British Empire out of the deal in the long run, the immediate result was England deciding they now had a constitutional right to treat Scotland like a colony. Ah, interesting. As you can see, uh, as an American, I can certainly relate to being uh, a history of being, uh, you know, a British colony. <laughs> this is kind of a recurring problem, and it led to two revolts for Scottish independence in 1715 and in 1745. This has happened like three times so far, when there's sort of arrangements set up, where Scotland is kind of a colony, that's a good word for it, I guess, of England. And then immediately it's like, revolt, revolt! <laughs> it's like, no, we don't like this. Freedom. Both failed, but the second one spooked England into being slightly less despicable about everything. In the next okay. century and a half following the rebellions, things turned remarkably for the better as the Enlightenment came north. Writers like Walter Scott and Robert Burns helped rekindle the Scottish identity, and thinkers like Adam Smith and David Hume radically changed European perspectives on rational thought and economics. Hume cool. claimed that reason was the core of human thought, and Smith described the benefits of letting people act in their own self-interest. This all sounds okay. very profound, but don't be fooled. The Are these... Scottish? Philosophers? Or economists? Or that wasn't totally clear to me. Clear Scottish subtext to these ideas are the English don't make a damn lick of sense <laughs> and we'd be better off making our own decisions. <laughs> <laughs> they must be Scottish, <laughs> if they're saying this. And you can't expect a Scottish Enlightenment thinker to not bury snide comments at England under two tons of hard academic theory. Though Scotland yeah. had long been an educational powerhouse, in the following two centuries they also became the- Are they? Were, were they an educational powerhouse? That's quite a compliment. Uh, Scotland, educational powerhouse, never knew. Industrial heart of the British Empire, producing such famous doodads as the steam engine, the telephone, radar, and mechanical television, and also most of the ships in the Imperial Royal Navy. What? Nice. Wait, what? These all these things all came from Scotland? Hold up. They also became the endemic theory. Though Scotland had long been an educational powerhouse, in the following two centuries they also became the industrial heart of the British Empire, producing such famous doodads as the steam engine, the telephone, radar, and mechanical television, what? and also most of the ships in the Imperial Royal Navy. What? I had no idea. I had no clue. I mean, I don't really claim to know where lots of inventions, inventions came from. Uh, <laughs> I've honestly never really thought about that much, but... These are some of the most important inventions to humanity ever. Ever. Telephone? Steam engine? Steam engine, the telephone, radar, and mechanical- Radar? Television, and also most of the ships in the Imperial Royal Navy. Nice. What? Other happy benefits- Scotland. Nice. <laughs> Fisheries of the 18th and 19th centuries were the cities of Glasgow and Edinburgh, which built up substantially in the Georgian neoclassical style, and they just look really damn pretty. Yeah, look at this. This is, like, beautiful. That's, like, amazing. Pretty. Funny thing about the Edinburgh Castle is instead of firing off 12 cannon shots to mark the passing of noon like the English do, they just wait one hour and save 11 rounds. That is so <laughs> Scottish. Quickly <laughs> approaching the modern day now, Scottish attitudes towards the Union grew more suspicious as England seems to care less and less by the decade about what happened up north, and the hard-forged British okay. identity faded with time and the decline of the British Empire. After years of campaigning, Scotland gained greater autonomy and the right to hold their own parliament in 1999. And 
1999. That's not that long ago. That's amazing. 23 years ago, Scotland uh, created its own parliament, separate from, like, being part of the United Kingdom Parliament, I assume? And the first words spoken there were, quote, The Scottish Parliament, adjourned on the 25th of March, 1707, is hereby reconvened. <laughs> reconvened after 300 years. That's funny. That's, <laughs> that's kind of cool. And if that is not some big Scotland energy right there, then yeah. wrap me in a tartan plaid and throw me in Loch Ness because I done I know. Bagpipes as well. Now that I'm hearing them, are bagpipes a big Scottish thing? Or is that like an American stereotype? Because that is certainly something people think of when they think of Scotland. Oh, what is? Now, if you want to jump into the tumultuous world of medieval Scottish murder kings, then you've got to go for Shakespeare's Macbeth. And one of the best ways to do mm. that is with today's sponsor, Audible. With oh, okay. Don't have to hear too much about Audible. At your own perfect pace. Audible member store. If you're some of Shakespeare's offering, our link is I think that's it. So, uh, I think that's it. We're kind of in the modern day now. We we did it. That was by overly sarcastic productions. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, I like that a lot. I liked your video. Very nice. Uh, wow. That was educational, to say the least. Um, I am absolutely astounded that Americans are not aware of basically any of this history. For one thing, it's fascinating, but for another thing, it's just so important, you know, on the glo on the world stage. You know what I mean? Um, as its huge relationship with England, which, you know, England's just a whole other history that Americans are basically not taught about, except, you know, the parts where it relates to America and the American Revolution. We care about that all of a sudden, but, you know, uh, this stuff is so, so, like, important and interesting that I feel like, uh, more Americans should actually be aware of this. And, uh, it makes everything make so much sense, and there's so much to learn from it. Anyway, I, I enjoyed that immensely. Uh, very glad I, I watched, I watched this. So, anyway, if you're glad that you watched this, then <laughs> feel free to give it a like or leave a comment. And if you're interested in more videos like this, me reacting to UK culture, history, news, and stuff I've never seen before, feel free to subscribe for more. And until then, thanks for watching, and see you next time.